welcome to Hard Fire. I'm your host, Joseph Dobrian, and with me this evening is my guest, Jim Lashinsky, the um, chairman of the Manhattan Libertarian Party. And Jim, you struck a major blow for liberty just the other day when you filed suit in the Supreme Court of New York against uh, Mayor Bloomberg and uh, a cast of dozens of other villains. Um, tell me, what was that suit about? I know, but our audience may not. Well, yeah, this, that, that suit was against a cast of thousands. We pretty much threw in everybody that could possibly be a defendant in the rogues gallery down at City Hall and the government offices. And what are you suing them for? Uh, we are suing them uh, for the uh, campaign finance program, otherwise known as the matching funds law. Uh, which gives up up to six of our tax dollars to politicians for every one dollar they raise for their uh, campaigns. It's it's essentially political welfare scheme. In other words, if you or I were to run for office, um, unless we refused it on principle, which right. we might do, um, we could apply for, in effect, welfare from the government funded by our tax dollars to run our campaign. Exactly. Yeah, it's not enough for for the merit of your ideas to attract voters to um, support your campaign. Uh, the theory behind this legislation apparently is that uh, you need government support to help you run a good campaign. Right, and um, with these matching fund laws, we are actually obliged by law to put our tax dollars to the support of candidates whose views we might find absolutely repugnant, correct? It, it, correct, and that's the basis of our lawsuit. Uh, it's a, a really a First Amendment case. Uh, the First Amendment gives us the right to free speech, and an essential component of free speech is the right not to speak, uh, not to, to be forced to say something you disagree with, and not to support the speech of somebody you disagree with. And by forcing you or me or other taxpayers to use our, our tax money to support uh, candidate that we may, may object to. Um, it's a, essentially compelled political speech. Okay. Now, um, some some hair splitter might argue that, uh, after all, the federal constitution has a First Amendment, but um, is local law governed by that? I mean, after all, uh, I think it was John Jay who said that uh, the powers of the federal government are limited and finite. Those of the local government are many and infinite. But, um, well, and some accounts, one of the uh, Constitution, of course, is the highest law in the land, and all other rights are supported to that. There's also the 14th Amendment, which uh, says that the, uh, the um, provisions of the Constitution also, the, the Bill of Rights also applies to the states. Uh, furthermore, the New York State Constitution, Article 1, Section 8, uh, has free speech language pretty similar to the First Amendment. Uh, if not identical in language, pretty darn close. And well, so there's a New York State uh, constitutional provision for free speech. Okay, that's good to know, but uh, are the courts going to enforce it? Do you think we've got a shot with this suit? Oh, well, uh, as I like to tell people, I think I won this suit the moment I filed it. Uh, we're really fighting in the court of public opinion, and uh, shows like Hard Fire, in the press, uh, a lot of, um, of the media have picked up on this already, and we're hoping for more. And so... What we're really hoping to do is shine a light on this um, obscene um, political welfare scheme. And whether the courts agree with it or not, I think it's a sound legal case, but it's really beside the point as far as I'm concerned. I really don't care what some guy in a black dress down in Center Street has to say about this. I, I know what's right, I know what the Constitution says, and I'm just hoping to turn a lot of more people on to uh, this outrage and uh, get more voters upset about it. Okay, but now supposing you win your suit, what would the consequences be immediately? Well, the consequences immediately be, would be that these people running for office would have to run on the merits of their campaign, and if they have a strong campaign, then people will support them with, with uh, financial contributions and with volunteer support, and if they don't want to support them, they won't. People would have to um, rise and fall on their own merits and not on government subsidy. Okay, but now the argument that I hear is that uh, these campaign financing laws, which, as you say, amount to government welfare for ca political candidates, people will say, well, but at least they ensure clean elections. Now, I'm not sure I believe that. Do you? No, I, I definitely don't believe that. That's really the, the excuse to use. But if you really look at it, uh, this is uh, one party town, New York City. In uh, 2001, in the last uh, time we had citywide elections, I think $42 million of tax money was given to these candidates. Uh, $40 million of it went to the Democratic candidates and $2 million to the Republicans, and essentially zero to the uh, third-party campaign. So it really 
just went to support the people already in power, make it further entrench the incumbents. In um, in 2003, in the city council elections, uh, every out of all 52 council seats, everybody that ran did run for re-election. I think 42 of them, they were all easily re-elected. And most of them took matching funds, even though they didn't face any real threat, but they just wanted to eliminate the threat of, of competition. Exactly so. Um, this strikes me as um, uh, just a way of making the rich richer and the poor poorer. Exactly. Whereas, you know, oftentimes the argument that we get from non-libertarians is that, well, gosh, if we didn't have public funding for political campaigns, then only rich people would ever run and the whole government would be run totally by rich people. I'm saying, what the heck is the difference between what we would have then and what we've got now when the, of course, the more funds you raise, the more money you get from the government. Exactly. It's, it's, it's an entrenched political class, and the people in power use the mechanisms of power and the trappings of power to keep their power. And the, the rig, and this is just one of many ways that they rig the system in favor of incumbency. The uh, campaign finance reform, bipartisan campaign reform act that McCain pushed through last year as really an incumbent protection act. Um, and so many of the ballot access laws that really make it hard for third parties like the Libertarians or the Greens to get on the ballot and make it really easy for the Democrats or Republicans um, to, to get on the ballot. It really just ensures that there's no meaningful contesting of these elections. Right. And what I think is remarkable and really rather frightening is that we do have this entrenched governing class, not only in New York, but in every locality practically, in every state of the Union, and of course, worst of all, at the federal level. And nobody seems to be at all outraged about this, that um, generally speaking, we allow our worst elements to um, get elected to public office because uh, none of the decent people um, can, can be persuaded to, uh, to dive into that muck. It's true. The scum does rise to the top. And uh, most people that you or I would be comfortable with uh, holding those offices aren't interested in them. They're not interested in having power over other people. There's essentially, when you think about it, there's two types of people in this world. There's the people that just want to be left alone, and there's the people that don't want to leave them alone. And the people and that, guess that don't which want... group of people runs for public office exactly. and gets elected and gets to make all the rules. Right. That's what I've been saying for a long time. We have, in this country, we are governed by Miss Gulch. Whoever Remember? Miss Gulch is. The Wizard of Oz? Uh, I'm going to take that dog and see that he's destroyed! Right. I, I think she turns that is, into the Wicked Witch yeah, of the West. I, I, that sounded like Michael Bloomberg there for a second. Exactly so. <laughs> no, she wasn't killed by a bucket of water, as the movie would have us believe. No, no. She lives on, reincarnated as Michael Bloomberg. But um, that you bring up a very interesting point, and this is a perfectly good segue into a discussion of the Libertarian Party in general, which is a party that, although it's the third biggest party in the United States, it's a party that many people have not heard of, and would probably vote for if they knew about it. Can you um, give us the uh, the quick definition of what a libertarian is for somebody who might not have heard of it? Sure. A uh, libertarian uh, simply is somebody who philosophically believes that it is always wrong to initiate force. Um, we believe in the defensive use of force, the retaliatory use of force. But basically, we don't start fights. We may finish them, or we may... We, uh, retaliate against them, but we don't believe in force and we don't believe in fraud and everybody would think here that, okay, well, I'm a libertarian. I don't believe in initiating force or fraud, uh, but it's really the uh, very consistent, rigorous application of that ideal that separates libertarians from the other political philosophies. Okay, exactly so. And people get a lot of wrong ideas about us. Some people think that we are extreme leftists. Others say we're extreme rightists. I've even heard people call us fascists. Now, where do they get that idea? I, I have no idea where they get that from, except that uh, fasc uh, fascist seems to be uh, a good word to use against people that you disagree with politically. Uh, but, yeah, I think the, the more common misperception is that libertarians are part of the uh, the right-wing conspiracy. And I'm certainly not part of any right-wing conspiracy. I, I, have, I think, on average, I take more umbrage with the Republicans than with the Democrats, although I can't really stand either, either of them. But it's really neither left nor right. It's about uh, really more about more government power, less government power, more personal freedom or less personal freedom. Do you trust people to run their lives or, or don't you? Uh -huh. And that's another point, trusting other people. So many people, when they object to libertarianism, they say, but, you know, 
people are not good. You, you, you libertarians, you seem to assume that everybody's good, that everybody's going to do the right thing. Uh, we can't make that assumption. That's why we have to have government. Right. And, and again, that gets back to, well, well look who the people that, that uh, seek government power are. They're the people that you can't trust and you wouldn't want to trust. The very fact, if you, if you believe that people are, are that bad and they can't be trusted, guess which people are going to be going for government power? And that's why we have to have limited government, if any, is, is to keep those people uh, from ruining our lives by giving them power over us. Okay, now some people would have you believe that libertarians uh, do not want any government at all. That's not quite true, is it? Uh, it, it depends. I, I think there's, uh, within the big tent of libertarianism, uh, you have what we call minarchists who believe in the uh, a small, limited government, and we even have an anarchist swing of the libertarian uh, movement that believes no government. It really comes down to, uh, you know, that the whole force or, or fraud um, proposal that I, I mentioned earlier. And um, certainly if you had a government that did not initiate force or fraud, um, you would have a libertarian government. Um, I think the U.S. Uh, United States, the way it was originally envisioned by the founders, came pretty close to that ideal, with uh, certain egregious exceptions like slavery and so forth. But um, the ideal of the uh, the Bill of Rights and that people would have sole dominion over their lives and the government would really just only serve to protect their rights. That's right. close Although, to a course, libertarian ideal of government. The Founding Fathers were not really so libertarian at the state and local level. Some of them were quite authoritarian at, at the lower levels right. of government, but uh, they were much less so at the, uh, at the federal levels. Mm -hmm. Now, um, that's another point. Um, libertarians can differ. There are some who say we need oh, at least a little bit of government, and there are others who say, no, we don't need hardly any at all. Probably, if you were to get a consensus, it would be that uh, government should exist to um, enforce laws against force and fraud, enforce legal contracts, uh, protect its citizens against force and fraud, and perhaps um, take charge of national defense, but not much more than that, correct? Right. Correct. And, uh, you know, and then there are some libertarians that would argue that even many of those things you mentioned could be replaced by private systems. For the courts, there's, um, there are private arbitration systems. There are, you, could, you could take it to the people's court. Uh, you know, there, there, are, uh, there are private police entities in this country, private uh, fire departments. And so there, there are really a lot of ways that, that you can even get rid of the, the quote, essential uh, services of government, and um, you know maybe we don't need to have that argument yet, but certainly we can strip away a lot of government that's unnecessary before we get to the part to really question, okay, what parts are essential? Right. I would suggest to our uh, viewers that if they wanted to get an idea of how a libertarian government might work, uh, they should try a novel by Robert Heinlein called "The Moon Is a Harsh Mistress." Uh, I love that book. Yeah. 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 I um, read it when I was in college before I'd even heard of libertarianism, and I said, hey, this might work. And then later on I found out, hey, that's what, they're, that's what they mean when they talk about libertarianism. Right. And um, so there are arguments against libertarianism, and some of them, let's face it, are hard to meet, and some of them are pretty easy to shoot down. But um, I'm going to give you some of the, um, the ones that I hear most commonly. And... Um, you can, you can tell me what the libertarian argument is against them. Libertarians, for example, the one I hear so often, and uh, I resent it, it's, uh, it strikes me as ignorant and emotionalistic, but I do hear it a lot. People will say, well, libertarians don't believe that you should rescue a drowning child, that it's every, everyone for himself, and if you see a kid drowning in a river, you shouldn't go in after it. Right. No, well, that's just silly. Yeah. No, no, um, there is no... Um uh, that has nothing to do with libertarianism. I think the question would be, okay, if you want somebody to rescue a drowning child, are you going to trust an individual to rescue them? Or are you going to form a government committee and see if we can uh, get some sort of program going to, to uh, rescue this child? And hopefully by the time the program's in place, the, the, the child won't have drowned. Right. <laughs> um, and uh, some, somewhat related to that is the idea of um, where is charity going to come from? Because... Um, as the good book says, uh, the poor will always be with us, whether we have a libertarian or an authoritarian society. Um, some people say that uh, government-run charities, government-run welfare systems are absolutely essential to the survival of these truly needy people, whereas libertarians say, no, we can take care of them 
that is, if we feel like it, uh, through uh, private charities. Um, what is the libertarian stance on on social welfare and charity and uh, so forth? Uh, you know, the libertarian stance is that social welfare and charity are, are, are wonderful things, and um, certainly they are to be encouraged in, in a polite society. Uh, on the other hand, uh, government doesn't really do a good job of it. If you look at the um, the uh, great uh, society that Lyndon Johnson envisioned and ending the the war on poverty the war on poverty um, you know like any other government war that they seem to declare the war on poverty gave us more po more poverty just like the war on drugs gave us more drugs uh, I would certainly think that uh, people in the community uh, philanthropic organizations churches synagogues and so forth that are much better equipped and much better motivated to to help those who are less fortunate than some government bureaucracy. And if the w government wasn't taking so much of our, our money in taxes, there would be so much more that people could give. And right now it's really shifted from a, a personal responsibility, a resp sense of responsibility in the community to um, say, well, that's not my job, that's what taxes are for. Right. Well, that's what a lot of bleeding heart liberals argue, that if we reduce taxation, and give people back more of their own money, then people won't quote unquote be good and um, give to charity. I say, first of all, why would it make anybody less charitable if they had more money to spend? And second of all, what business is it of yours how good people are? Exactly, and, and, and furthermore, it wasn't, wouldn't take as much money if, it, if there wasn't that big bureaucracy. I mean, you give money, when money is taken from you and goes to Washington, it doesn't go directly back to the charities. There's a whole big layer of overhead that you have to account for. A lot of paper pushers and bureaucrats that have to take their cut before some dwindles back down to the charities. If you had direct charity um, they, where people were giving money to the charities that they, they like, which some, some people do now, it, it's much more effective and much more responsive. And if you see that they're not doing a good job with it, um, you wouldn't be inclined to give to that charity. I, you know, if, I, if the um, government uh, welfare system were a private charity and we saw how they're doing, uh, the job they're doing uh, helping the poor, most of us would not be inclined to give to that charitable entity. Exactly so. And if the social security system were a uh, privately run retirement fund, then the fund manager would probably be in jail. By exactly. Now. Uh, no, only only government could get get away with the Ponzi scheme like Social Security. Exactly. Now, um, you mentioned a moment ago that the war on drugs has actually led to more drugs, and that's an interesting point about libertarians. We generally favor legalization of drugs, not just so soft drugs, so to speak, like marijuana, but all drugs, anything you want to put mm -hmm. in your body, fine. Now that is where we tick off a lot of conservatives and right-wingers. Explain the libertarian reasoning behind why drugs should be legalized. Well, the libertarian reasoning is that uh, it's a really a principle of self-ownership. You own your body. Uh, you can do whatever you want with it. Uh, and I think most people, or a lot of people, especially in New York, will say, you know, a woman owns her body when it comes to things like the right to uh, choose to terminate a pregnancy. Uh, but when it comes to things like drug use or prostitution, uh, well, no, so she doesn't really own her own body, you know, like that, that's deplorable. Uh, there's an old libertarian joke that says, uh, you know, we seem to believe that um, a woman owns her own body when it comes to her uterus, but the vagina belongs to the government. <laughs> and on that note, I think it's a good time to break away for just a moment and uh, tell our viewers about the um, website of the Manhattan Libertarian Party. If you're interested in learning more about libertarianism and perhaps joining the Libertarian Party, just um, go to your computer and punch in www.manhattanlp.org. And um, once you're there, you can send an email asking for more information, and the email address is info at manhattanlp.org. That'll give you a good start in your voyage towards libertarianism, which we hope will last the rest of your life. Now. Um, we are equal opportunity offenders, aren't we? Oh, we, certainly, We yeah. make the Republicans angry and the Democrats angry, whether you're liberal or conservative or left-wing or right-wing. You're going to find something about libertarians that annoys you. That's a fair assessment, I think. For example, the issue... Including other libertarians. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> we can't even agree on lunch, I'm telling you. But, um, <clears throat> for example, the left tends to dislike us because we are not in favor of redistributing the wealth, particularly through taxation. 
Um, but uh, people are going to say, well, golly, there have to be some taxes, haven't there? Uh, that, that, that is what they say, and uh, well, I, I certainly don't buy that. And um, you know, I, I think it really, that really comes back to that, again to that principle of self-ownership we, we were discussing before the break. If you own yourself, uh, do you own the fruits of your labor? If you produce something that wasn't produced before you, you put your labor to it, don't you have an essential right to that? And uh, you know, and this is something that uh, you know. I think philosophically that even Republicans will take umbrage with us um, too, because they say they'll say, "Oh, you know, we believe the people it's their money and they should keep it." And that's why we only want to take 33 percent of it instead of 39 percent of it. But okay, well, okay, well, if you believe it's really the people's money that they earned it and they're entitled to keep it, then what entitles you to more than zero? Okay, but then how do we go about funding um, essential government functions? Assuming, well, th let's face it, there are some essential government functions. How do we fund them? Okay, well, there, there's a variety of non-coercive uh, ways you can raise it. It's really, it's the burden is on the people that, that wanted to make the case that that, that this, this uh, project is needed and the money will come. Uh, so there's, there's, for example, uh, there's user fees on and for example, parks and you know toll roads and that sort of thing. There's uh, lotteries. There's um, there's spo there's sponsorships. Uh, well, Central Park Conservancy takes uh, a lot of the burden out of administering Central Park. There's even private parks like like uh, Gramercy. Uh, and there's there's a vari variety of, of ways to get somebody to pay for it, something other than to say, well, we want this badly enough that we're to take the money from you, and and maybe. You know, somebody won't contribute to it, and you know, maybe somebody, somebody's just a tightwad. But you know, that's their money, and they have the right to keep it. Uh, you know, if something is truly essential, like uh, national defense, I would imagine people would contribute to that voluntarily. Okay, but now uh, talking about things that might be deemed absolutely essential, how about the education of uh, children whose parents just can't afford a private school? No way, no how, or kids whose parents don't give a rat's ass and won't bother to send them to school. What do we do about that in a libertarian system? Well, the thing is, I think the, the other way to look at that is, is what do we do about that in the current system? And the answer is that those kids don't get educated. Uh, if there is not a, a drive at home for, for the children to be educated, um, they're not going to get educated. And certainly not sending them to a big uh, government institution to be one of 30 kids in a, in a room. They're not going to get educated. The, the learning really starts at home. And you know, there's always homeschooling, and uh, you know, you can pull your resources among other student, other uh, parents. And you know, I think one of the fallacies is, well, you know, I work. How am I supposed to, to homeschool my child? And it really takes only what the schools teach in eight hours. You can probably teach your child in two to three hours a day, if that. Okay, but now we have uh, compulsory education all through the United States. Would right. that be? Uh, would that? That would stand go. Under, that would go. Right. Okay. Suits me. Yeah, I, I, I hated school when I was a kid. I I, I couldn't wait to get out. And uh, I think you know again, who has the best interest in seeing that the child is educated? The child himself, the parents, or the education system? And you know, it really kills me when we hold up people like Randy Weingarten, the head of the United Federation for Teachers. Well, she said this, and she's there representing the children. She's not representing the children. She's representing the employees of this big bureaucracy. Exactly <laughs> so. Well, you know, when, um, when Dr. Samuel Johnson said that patriotism is the last refuge of the scoundrel, he completely overlooked the immense possibilities of the phrase, our children. Oh yes, uh, for, for the Children is, has um, been responsible for a more bad government policy than probably any other uh, catchphrase. Exactly so. Uh, until stop the, stopping the terrorists and um, you know, if we don't do this then the terrorists will have won. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. But I would submit that uh, if we want to talk about what's good for the children, we've got to inculcate in them principles of Personal freedom, personal responsibility. Exactly. And that is some. That is a concept. Those are concepts that have been pretty much forgotten. I saw a recent poll that uh, said that something like 68 percent of uh, uh, Americans under 18 say that the First Amendment goes too far. Well, somebody has been teaching them that. Right. We right. didn't used to think about that when I was a kid. As a matter of fact, I think that's an essential difference between kids of today and kids of our generation. When I was a kid in school, 
we were taught over and over again, freedom, freedom, freedom. That is such an important American concept. No, all we hear is safety, safety, safety. And if it comes at the expense of freedom, well, then so be it. How can we fight against that? Uh, well, we can fight against that first by getting the kids out of the government schools. Um, you know, that's why I don't like to even use the word public schools, the government schools. And really what they are is indoctrination camps. They're, they're, they're the reproductive arm of the welfare state. Uh, and, and uh, you know, there, there, there's just so much propaganda going on in the schools right now. And that's one more reason why my parents have to take responsibility for educating their children and instilling those values of freedom. And maybe the parents don't even have those values. So it is an uphill battle, but, you know, we have to start somewhere. Okay, that's one thing that you can do if you feel that there is not enough freedom in this country and that our, what freedom we have is being gradually taken away more and more every day. But what are some of the other... Uh, random acts of, in favor of freedom that an ordinary citizen can do without inconveniencing himself too much. Oh, there's all sorts of things. I, you know, I think voting is probably the least effective of them. Uh, I think uh, jury nullification is, is can be a very powerful tool. Uh, you know, the, the uh, sl slavery was, um, and the Fugitive Slave Act in particular, was largely overturned by uh, juries in the North refusing to convict um, a fugitive slave or somebody who was harboring fugitive slaves. And the same thing in Prohibition, when laws become so manifestly unpopular that people refuse to support them, uh, then you know, when, the, when the justice system starts to break down, and then we see, okay, well, this law has been effect effectively nullified by the people. And I think one of the outrages in the court system today is when judges tell you, you must follow my orders and follow the facts of the law regardless of your conscience. And exactly. that's baloney. Yeah, well, in general, I think that uh, we have become so overburdened with laws that it's practically impossible to keep yourself within the law. And at some point, we have got to all get angry at once and defy the government. Right. And I think on that note, it's time for us to end. I'm Joseph Dobrian. And we'll be back one of these days soon with another edition of Hard Fire. You own your body. Uh, you can do whatever you want with it. Uh, and I think most people, or a lot of people, especially in New York, will say, you know, a woman owns her body when it comes to things like the right to uh, choose to terminate a pregnancy. Uh, but when it comes to things like drug use or prostitution, uh, well, no, so she doesn't really own her own body, you know, like that, that's deplorable. Uh, there's an old libertarian joke that says, uh, you know, we seem to believe that um, a woman owns her own body when it comes to her uterus, but the vagina belongs to the government. <laughs>